Welcome to the eighth collection of Ministry of Defence UFO files released by the National Archives. I'm Dr David Clark, author of the UFO files and consultant to the National Archives UFO project. This collection contains 34 files that contain 8,600 pages of material covering uh, UFO policy, press stories, parliamentary questions, sighting reports and freedom of information requests. So I gather that uh, amongst all of these, there are some photos of sightings of UFOs, is that right? Yes. One snowy night in January 2004, a Nottinghamshire man took a series of colour slides showing Retford Town Hall. These were for submission to a photography competition. He saw nothing unusual at the time he took the photographs. But on examining the transparencies, he was amazed to find an image showing what appears to be a classic flying saucer, or at least an elliptical-shaped object in the sky. Having ruled out lens flares and aircraft, he contacted the Ministry of Defence to see if they were interested in looking at his photographs. They said defence experts would like to take a closer look at the mysterious elliptical object he had captured on slide film. He delivered the slide to the Ministry of Defence in March that year, and it was sent to the Defence Geographic and Imagery Intelligence Agency in July. After subjecting the image to detailed scrutiny, the DGIA said they were unable to reach any definitive conclusion about the nature of the mysterious image. But they did say that it might be coincidental that the illuminated plane of the object passes through the centre of the frame, which indicates a possible lens anomaly such as a droplet of moisture. There are some other examples of the MOD calling upon image analysis experts to help them evaluate UFO photographs. In 1994, VHS footage of a strange object in the sky near Bonnybridge in Scotland was sent to experts at RAF Brampton. They concluded that it cannot be determined whether this object is real or a hoax. It is possible it is a hoax using a kite or video studio effects. This type of work triggered a sharp exchange of views within the Ministry. In public, MOD policy was that they did not spend public money on UFO research, but in private, desk officers at the Defence Intelligence staff were keen to take a look at photographs and films showing UFOs that had been obtained by members of the public. In order to do so, MOD would need to approach people in order to gain access to their footage. This was seen as a risky strategy, as the press and ufologists would interpret any visits from the men from the Ministry as proof that a cover-up was underway. Similar problems bedeviled attempts to use public money to put details of UFO sightings received by the MOD onto a computer database for scrutiny. One early attempt to use an MOD computer to study UFOs in 1987 was halted after senior officials decreed that all work should cease as it was in contravention of ministerial statements to the effect that UFOs did not pose a threat to the UK. But the idea was revived in 1993 when a limited study was pr proposed by the intelligence staff. Despite the potential for political embarrassment if news leaked out, ironically, one official described the potential for what he called disbelief and embarrassment since few people will believe the truth that lack of funds and higher priorities have prevented any study of the thousands of reports they had received over the last 30 years. And can you say something about the threat from near-Earth objects? The files show that the Ministry of Defence was also drawn into the controversy over the potential threat to the Earth posed by near-Earth objects such as comets and asteroids. In 2000, the Minister of Science, Lord Sainsbury, set up a task force to assess the hazards. And during a visit to the Pentagon in March, three scientists from the task force discussed future plans with officials from the Department of Defence, NASA and the USAF Space Command. On return to the UK, they asked for a meeting to obtain an overview of the Ministry of Defence's current and possible UK contribution to international collaborative efforts. But comments on the files suggest that the MOD felt that they had, quote, no remit to defend the Earth against asteroids, or little green men for that matter. And one added, quote, it may be that our answer is that we are doing nothing about it, have no money to spare, and are content to leave such matters to the British National Space Centre. What can you tell us about the, the night the RAF was scrambled to intercept a UFO? One of the best-known stories in the UFO literature concerns unexplained phenomena that were recorded on British and American radars at RAF Lakenheath in Suffolk during August 1956. 
These files contain a first-hand account of this incident from a retired RAF fighter controller, Freddie Wimbledon. He was on duty at RAF Neetishead in Norfolk when the American Air Force reported a fast-moving blip on their airfield radars at Lakenheath. To his amazement, Wimbledon said that this UFO was also clearly seen on RAF radars. RAF Fighter Command ordered a Venom interceptor controlled by Wimbledon's radars to intercept this UFO. Wimbledon says, quote, It was vectored towards the object and the Venom pilot called Contact followed in a short while by Judy, which meant that the radar navigator had the target on his airborne radar. But then he called, Lost Contact, More Help. He was then told that his target was now behind him and it remained glued in that position, following the Venom's every move. A second Venom was scrambled, but it never got within 20 miles before the target sped off, climbing at terrific speed and disappeared from the defence radars. Wimbledon said afterwards all those involved in the incident were quizzed by a senior officer from Fighter Command who stressed the need for absolute secrecy. When I quizzed the Minister of Defence about this dramatic incident in 2001, they said an archive search had confirmed that all records of the Lake and Heath sightings had been lost or destroyed. This Lake and Heath incident is also mentioned by a retired Ministry of Defence official, Ralph Noyes, in this collection of files, who, in a letter to the Ministry of Defence in 1986, said that he had been shown gun camera film of UFOs taken by RAF Venom aircrew during a secret screening at the MOD main building in 1970. The MOD say no trace of these films has been discovered. Ralph Noyes also said that he was the private secretary to the Vice Chief of Air Staff during the summer of 1952 when news reached the Air Ministry and the then Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, of a spate of dramatic UFO sightings over Washington, D.C. According to Noyes, the Ministry's scientific advisor, Robert Coburn, was instructed to make inquiries with the Americans. But the report that came back convinced the Air Ministry that it was all, quote, American hysteria, and Churchill was advised that there was nothing in the UFO nonsense, as they described it. Noyes adds that after the events of 1952, quote, no further official notice was taken of the subject within the Air Ministry, but other subsequent events suggested to some of us that a UFO phenomenon of some kind or another certainly existed, but there were never solid grounds for regarding it as a defence threat or as justifying official steps such as the establishment of a standing committee of inquiry. As a result, the subject remained, according to Noyes, something of a joke, albeit an uneasy one on occasions. And then I gather there was a problem with uh, Glastonbury Festival uh, at one point and Chinese lanterns. Yeah, the UFO report files in this collection include details of a particular type of sighting that became common in Britain during the summer of 2006. These are descriptions of formations of orange lights drifting slowly across the night sky. They are almost certainly observations of Chinese lanterns or mini hot air balloons that are often released at wedding parties and music festivals during the summer. The Ministry of Defence received many reports of these types of UFO sightings from 2006. One account from Hearn Bay, Kent, filed in August of that year, describes eight yellow-orange spheres that looked like they had flames coming out of the back of them. Another from London describes hundreds of fireballs that were an amazing sight in the night sky. Chinese lanterns almost certainly explain a report of revolving lights that were spotted above the pyramid stage at the Glastonbury Festival one night in the summer of 2003. However, other sightings are a little more difficult to account for. And I gather one of those more difficult incidents happened in the Channel Islands? One unexplained incident was a report submitted to the Civil Aviation Authority by the pilot of a Trilander aircraft during April 2007. He described seeing a long cigar-shaped object, sparkling yellow in colour, hovering in the sky as the prop-driven plane approached Alderney in the Channel Islands in broad daylight. The captain estimated the size of this UFO as being about that of a Boeing 737. This strange object was also seen by a number of passengers on the small plane as it hovered above the sea just 15 miles from the small aircraft. As they prepared for landing, the pilot reported his sighting to air traffic control in Jersey, who asked other pilots to look out for anything unusual. As he was speaking to the ground control, the Trilander pilot then saw a second UFO, identical in shape to the first, that appeared to be further away. 
The Ministry of Defence file on this incident also includes an account from the pilot of a jet stream aircraft who, alerted by air traffic control, looked out and saw a similar unusual object in the sky above the English Channel at the same time. But the Royal Air Force said nothing was seen on radar and no further investigation was required as the sightings occurred in French airspace. Again, this unexplained sighting remains one of the more intriguing puzzles in the MOD's X-Files. And what can you tell us about the Rendlesham Forest incident? The Rendlesham Forest incident is possibly Britain's best-known cause celebre for the UK UFO community and is often referred to as Britain's Roswell. There are two files devoted almost entirely to the MOD's increasingly exasperated attempts to answer a long series of parliamentary questions tabled by the retired Chief of Defence Staff, the late Lord Hill Norton, between 1998 and 2001. One Ministry of Defence official describes Hill Norton as pursuing this campaign with evangelical fervour and notes that he was seen as a champion of the Rendlesham Forest case by proponents of the extraterrestrial hypothesis for UFOs. Although the papers do not contain any smoking gun, they do include a copy of a black and white photograph taken several days after the sightings in 1981 by an American airman based at RAF Woodbridge. These show a British police officer inspecting the landing site within the forest. One file also includes a letter sent by a Suffolk police inspector to the author Georgina Bruni, who was writing a book on the Rendlesham incident during the summer of 1999. He describes his officer's role in the incident as minimal and says that as the years passed, witness testimony had become substantially embellished. The inspector said the area was swept by the powerful beams from the Orford Nest Lighthouse and he said that he knew from personal experience that at night, in certain weather and cloud conditions, these beams were very pronounced and caused strange visual effects. All 34 files can be downloaded from the National Archives website at www.nationalarchives.gov.uk forward slash UFO.